morning. We got a lot of territory to cover. We got a lot of stuff we want to show you and talk, and we don't have a lot of time to do it. So I just want to say good morning. Thank you for all being here. This is the largest panel I've ever seen or that I've ever been a part of. So thank you. This is special for me because many years ago, 1990 uh, to be exact, um, right before Christmas, I left on what would become a great adventure of uh, filming the very first, what I called the very first G.I. Joe mini movie. But I even like what Carson calls it, the first live action micro movie. Carson's gonna uh, kind of ask me a few questions. We'll introduce some of the segments. This footage that we're gonna see has not been seen even by me since I shot it in 1990. So I just turned over a bunch of Sony eight millimeter videotapes and said, Carson, I have no idea what's on these tapes. And he took it from there. And I uh, said, I'll take it. <laughs> and it was, it's just been you know, a, a great uh, relationship that we've struck up over the last few years. And when I found out what he did for a living, I said, he's the man. So with that, we'll start. Awesome, thank you, Kirk. My clicker doesn't reach, so a big thanks to Jesse for helping out. And thanks to the Triangle Joes for filming this, and we'll put this on YouTube later for the folks that couldn't make it. Thank you, guys. So 1982, we started out with animated intros and live action scenes of kids playing with toys, and we also had product shots in the studio. We'll go to 83. And we continued that formula for 83. We'll go to 84. We continued the formula for 84. Not a lot of changes going on still. The primary voices were a voiceover narrator, voice of God kind of thing, and the kids playing with the toys, narrating how much fun they were having. And then we added kids into the live action product shots, which was very interesting, kind of micro kids inside of a big scene. So this was a ton of fun. This was envisioning yourself in the vehicles, playing with the vehicles, interacting with the vehicles for the first time. So this just woke my imagination. I wanted to ask Kirk first question. Did this lead into the live the adventure theme in 1986? Because this very much spoke to living the adventure. Yeah, that's exactly what evolved out of this was, you know, the fact that we had actually now we're showing commercials with kids interacting. In the lower left, you see the kids on the flight deck with the Sky Striker. You imagined yourself as part of the G.I. Joe team being on board a ship, and definitely it led to that whole idea of live the adventure. So the 86 catalog, you got the awkward kid in the corner that's going into the very dangerous wooded scene with the G.I. Joes, and everybody's like, what's that kid doing there? I'm like, he's living the adventure. So that, that's where this started, the whole live the adventure thing started in 85, a year earlier with putting kids into the scene. So we'll keep going to 86. So we introduced some 3D animation kind of modeling here at the beginning of the commercial to show this kind of Tron looking wireframe around the vehicles before it transformed into the real vehicle. We also introduced the first live action actor, which was Sergeant Slaughter. But I will say the Sergeant Slaughter scene was basically him walking up out of a jungle set and saying a couple lines. So it wasn't storytelling at this point. Then we introduced a second style of animation, which is the more watercolor kind of, this is called rotoscoping. You shoot the vehicles and then you draw over them and that creates a rotoscoped animation style. So there are now two animation styles. You have the traditional Sunbow cartoon and then you have the rotoscoped more watercolor look. That will only last for a couple years. We also still had the 3D wireframe, but now the 3D wireframe was color. So we're gonna hit the button to the right and play one of these commercials. That's right, it's William the Refrigerator Perry. The fridge is going G.I. Joe. Now you can get a free fridge. Here's how. Select five fridge certificates or call the number on the certificate and the fridge will tell you how to get in on the action with only four certificates. There's a $1 handling charge. See details on specially marked G.I. Joe packages. Watch out, Cobra. Fridge is coming through. Go, go! So that, that was actually our second live action character, The Fridge. The first one is on the left. I think we might have clicked past it and that's totally fine because we're short on time. We'll put it online. Um, so let's click to the next slide. That Joe's surrounded by Cobras. Yeah, but that Joe's Sergeant Slaughter. He's joined the G.I. Joe team. So we're celebrating by giving away Sergeant Slaughter action figures, but you can't buy them in stores. You've got to earn them. Here's how. Collect five Sergeant Slaughter certificates or call the number on the certificate and Sergeant Slaughter will tell you how to get in on the action with only four certificates. There's a $1 handling charge. See details in specially marked packages. G.I. Joe! Nobody takes on Cobras better than Sergeant Slaughter. Yeah, Joe! 
so, so you'll notice he has like one or two lines, and he's just stepping forward from a jungle. So that was it for live action. Let's keep going. All right, so we had still the two animation styles, the Sunbow style and the rotoscoped kind of watercolor textury looking one. We'll keep going. And then we introduced the first live action commercial. This isn't a micro movie. This isn't as exhaustive as what Kirk did for a month of his life and put his marriage in danger for in 1991. <laughs> this is just a much smaller commercial, so we'll show this one. Introducing the ultimate warrior. The G.I. Joe Super Trooper. There's only one way to get him. Send four Super Trooper certificates and a $1 handling charge. See details on specially marked packages for your Super Trooper. The ultimate warrior. I don't, I don't know about you guys, but my mind was blown when I saw that commercial. It was G.I. Joe come to life. He beat up like 12 Iron Grenadiers in that commercial. Plus there were ninjas. I don't know if y'all noticed the ninja characters. So that was really cool. So Kirk, uh, second question was, where did, the where did the decision to do live action storytelling to illustrate the product come from? Well, this, this commercial might have been the genesis of it. Um, this was going to be a one-off commercial that Griffin Call created for us. Uh, they were looking to um, do something a little different for the promotional spot. In actuality, Griffin Bacall, got, who was our main agency, um, got very jealous of an idea that was presented to us by BBDO, my advertising agency that I was working with when I was handling G.I. Joe Direct, Direct Mail Program. Uh, we had hired BBDO Direct uh, to provide us with the creative. BBDO Direct, one of the oldest ad agencies in the country, um, came up with this live action idea and presented it to me because I was doing the Super Trooper um, idea for um, part of the G.I. Joe direct mail offers. Um, and I said, yeah, this is great because now I'm in competition with guys working on the G.I. Joe brand. And competition is what makes me, you know, tick. Yeah, exactly. When I saw this, I presented it to our management team. The management team loved it. Griffin Bacall, um, I could see kind of liked it, but then said, we want to do the filming because we want it to be consistent with the G.I. Joe brand. No problem. So uh, we did this shot in New York City, was the most expensive single commercial Hasbro had ever shot at that time. Wow. And stuck in the back of my head, the live action. Awesome. So that's a, there's a very direct line from Kirk. Kirk basically worked on the brand from 82 to 86, and then he single-handedly helped build uh, Hasbro, the mail order direct program. And so he pioneered this first live action commercial too, and I didn't know that, so that's great. We'll keep going. Uh, 89, we had live action Sergeant Slaughter on every commercial. We'll keep going. All right, so then we had live action Sergeant Slaughter interacting with an animated uh, overlord, right? It was funny, the banter back and forth between them was a good interaction, and I bought the live action and animated commercial mix. So then we got to the big pioneering moment where we decided to do live action and serial storytelling. So live action obviously is live actors with costumes. Serial storytelling means you're building on each commercial to build a sequential narrative. So if you watch all these commercials back to back to back, you're gonna get one big story. And so that's why we call it the first micro movie. So we'll move to the next slide. So that brings us to 1991. This is what Kirk spent you know, a month of his life doing between Thanksgiving and Christmas. And uh, it was very perilous. Uh, as you'll see, there's some very dangerous scenes here. They changed the way they did it between 91 and 92 because of that. So I don't want to spoil it too much. Let's show the next slide. There's Kirk. I look happy then. <laughs> but uh, there's a whole other part of the story behind yeah. this. Yep. All right, so we'll, get, we'll jump into the next slide. This is an introduction uh, from Kirk showing you guys around the facility. The G.I. Joe, the micro movie, day one, the ice cave set. This is a portion of the paralyzer, which will be used in a fight sequence later on. There's the tracks. And this is one of the G.I. Joe battle copters. Finishing touches being put on to the colors. And they're almost ready to fly. So over in the corner there is the badger and a wheel from the badger, which will be attached to it. This is our G.I. Joe arsenal, all different kinds of guns. This is the backdrop. It's about 150 feet long. 
That's the largest uh, sky ever done for any G.I. Joe commercial, certainly for most of any commercials ever done. Here we are creating the uh, miniature world of G.I. Joe. But the most impressive set is this, Cobra's Temple of Doom. This is the back of the Cobra Temple of Doom. And you just get a nice panoramic view of the studio with all the crew members busily putting everything together. They're putting some finishing touches now to the interior. And getting prepared for what we think is going to be a very, very exciting shoot the G.I. Joe. All right, so that was just uh, basically an introduction to it. Uh, Kirk, if you want to say a couple things about first impressions, people you worked with. Yeah, um, before we do that, let's explain why we decided to go to the live action because that was a big fight with Griffin McCall as well. Um, Griffin McCall uh, had created the G.I. Joe um, idea of animation, introducing product, and they were locked into animation for, from 82 to uh, 90. The new buzzword in marketing today is to be a disruptor. disruptor. Uh, my whole career at Hasbro, I was a disruptor. I hated status quo. Um, my idea was always push the envelope, do different things. Uh, G.I. Joe peaked in sales in 1986. In 1987, 1988, 1989, into 1990, G.I. Joe was on a decline. So I was brought back onto the brand in 1989, having been doing other things from 86 to 89. The direct marketing program, I was in charge of Play School Baby, uh, as far away from Hasbro boys toys as you could get. Um, and so I was doing a lot of different things for Hasbro. Um, and when they brought me back, when I was brought back onto the line in 1980, end of 1989, I'm looking at sales and I'm watching my sales go south. Now what good marketing people try to do is prevent that, okay? <laughs> so what I did was I started thinking, what are we doing and how can we change? And the one common element that I saw was our advertising. Nothing had ever changed. Uh, we'd get the little tweak that you saw with the wireframe vehicle or whatever, or the rotoscoped vehicle, but you never saw a radical change. So when we filmed that live action Super Trooper commercial, that stuck in my head. And when I finally was put in complete command of G.I. Joe and Boys Toys um, in 1989, I met with Griffin Bacall and said, we gotta change things. Our, our business is going south, and we've got to do something different. I want to see live action. Joe Bacall, the, producer, the, the creative director at Griffin Bacall, said there's no way, impossible, we can't do it. It's going to be too expensive. So I said, show me a budget. Don't just tell me it's going to be too expensive. Show me a budget, because I knew how expensive the animation was, mm -hmm. okay? So about a month later, um, this is early summer of 1990, um, Joe comes into us, with, into a meeting with me, and he says, said, we have a way we think we can shoot this commercial and make it on budget. We have to go away and shoot all, every single commercial in one shoot. Now ordinarily what we did is, we'd do three or four commercials, come back home, relax for a, a couple of months, go off to another location, do three or four commercials. This time we had to shoot, I think it was a dozen commercials all at one time to maximize the use of the studio. So that's just a little background on, on how this evolved. So. Great, thank you. So the way that it's organized going forward, you'll see footage from behind the scenes of the making of a specific commercial. Then you'll see a very new master that just came off a of VHS master. I wish we had beta or something, but it's a VHS master and a DVD master of the first four live action commercials. Happy to supply this to anybody and everybody. Uh, I would say uh, Yojo uh, just worked with Declassified to uh, give out a hard drive this morning full of TV commercials. I'm partnering with Yojo to share all of our TV files uh, across both of our platforms. We work together in the benefit of the brand. So these commercials will be going out on Yojo's channels and, and my 3D Joe's channels as well. So you'll be seeing those. So we're going to go ahead and start the first commercial here. <laughs> Okay, here we go. Set, very quiet. All right, roll tape. Camera. Action. Action. 
get me that plasma touch and Pavro will rule the world! Action! Get me that plasma touch and Pavro will rule the world! Well, this is a Right to me, if you will. I'm over here, over here, over here. Keep coming. Keep coming. Alright, now we got that toy straight. Two, three, two, two. Ah! Don't fall. It's broken, I remember that. We're in the car. Yeah. Can we pull a rock? Sony makes a Guys, you gotta dig it out and back it up as far as we can go. Looks pretty good, eh? Yeah. I mean, it really looks real. Yeah. Johnny, Johnny keeps saying we're filming a feature movie here, and I said, you're absolutely right. <laughs> it's true, eh? <laughs> you're going to have to lay this in. You're going to have monster explosions. So. Roll it! Okay, we all set? Yes. Gary, get, pull, come back a little bit, Gary. A little more wheel. Just where? Wait, call the camera. But that's all. Here we go. Here we go. Set. We're rolling? Yes. Here we go. Ready and action. That's all. Let's go fast, snake for us. I am cut. A new mask. Yeah. Get me the plasma tops and Cobra will rule the world! Here comes the sinister Cobra Paralyzer with three awesome missiles that really fire! Fire! Let's go the plasma tops! Cobra! Not so fast! Snake drop! It's the G.I. Joe Badger with three powerful firing missiles! Fire! G.I. Joe! Cobra Paralyzer and G.I. Joe Badger sold separately! Anybody got a parachute? John Sterner, the director of these commercials, became a very good friend of ours. John, if you are familiar with the uh, Tyco RC uh, vehicle commercials, John Sterner filmed every one of those Tyco vehicle commercials. That was his expertise. He was not a theatrical movie director. This was all new territory for John Sterner and his crew. He had never done a commercial like this before. And so all the effects that you see in this commercial, the explosions, everything is done what they call via practical effects. There's no computer animation in these commercials. This is all using the old-fashioned squibs and explosive squibs. We had to have an armorer on the set, a guy who knew how to ex you know, set up explosive charges so that they would safely go off. And that'll, I'm sure you have Sometimes. footage. Yes, yeah, sometimes, because I'm sure you're going to show footage of when it didn't happen so safely. That's right. And that involved me. <laughs> All right, so uh, these slides will be on the extended video, but basically Christopher Lotta obviously did the voice of the uh, Cobra Commander, so that's why you heard the, the beep, 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 and then the actor took off, because he was acting to Christopher Lotta's voice. Uh, he's Roger Cross, who played Cobra Commander. He went on to be a very successful actor, according to uh, Ren Roberts, who's the Duke in the commercials. He says he's the one that really blew up and did some things, so a lot of TV shows and commercials. All right, so the end of the Paralyzer commercial had Duke in a very perilous situation falling off the side of a mountain, and the next time we saw him was at the beginning of the Air Commandos commercial, and he's fighting in a, like a puddle of Toxo sludge. So we didn't know what happened there. It was nonlinear, and that really bothered me. So we started searching. <laughs> And I obviously started with Yojo, uh, looked at my playlist. We didn't have the answer. What was that gap in the middle? So uh, thanks to Mr. Adam Riches and also Kirk Bazigian sending the new masters, we have found the missing second commercial. Never seen before. All right, so the mystery character that was in all of this footage that I knew there was a second commercial for was this guy, Major Altitude, very, uh, very nice costume. We'll keep going. And this will be the behind the scenes footage of this commercial followed by the new master. This is called green screen. It's a special technique that's used. And when you see Duke in the commercial, he'll actually look like he's falling through the air. 
Action! Look above my hand, and now! Need a left, Duke! Need a left, Duke! Quick, go back! Started too soon! Yes, it is! And action! Need a left, Duke! Remember that scene earlier? There's the special effects dubbed one on top of the other. One more time. Here you see the helicopter in the background. Did you catch your footage? And Duke there falling right in the there. foreground. You ready? Ready and action. Finishing touches being put to the Cobra Paralyzer. Ready and action! Perfect! Fire! Action! Perfect! Lay back. Here we go. Just a second, John. Okay, thank you. We're going one, we're ready. Let's go. Everyone on one. Just a second, John. Tell me when you have speed on the rotors. We got speed. Camera. Ready and action! Cut. Randy, all right? I'm, I'm fine. Okay. I'm hey, by the expression as you come down. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Action! Ah! One more time. Action! Ah! Cut! Action! Action! You're all locked up, Cobra! Get him! This is Duke getting ready for his big fall. You can see a lot of people going to uh, making a single scene happen. Okay, pull the boxes out, let's go. Ready and action is your cue. Can you see? Don't let him hit the ground hard. No, you get, you're going to get him all the way up. It'll be ready and action. you down. Now the fan is dead. Take it out. Okay, take him to one, Mike. Is that out of frame? Action! Go, Mike. I hate when this happens! Great, cut. Take him out, Mikey. Action! Go, Mike. I hate when this happens! Oh, great. Yeah. Need a lift, Duke? Thanks! Look, Cobra's got the plasma dog. But here comes G.I. Joe battle copters. Zip strip copters that really fly high. Perfect for dropping in unexpected. Watch out, Duke. Cobra's got battle copters, too. Cobra and G.I. Joe battle copters can work with any figure. G.I. Joe! G.I. Joe! Joe and Cobra battle copters sold separately with figure. I hate when this happens! Mystery solved. <laughs> there's, a, there's another little backstory to this commercial. Hasbro was fined $25,000 by the FTC for running this commercial. And uh, because ha Mattel complained that one of the shots in this commercial could never have been done, and they were right, um, <laughs> where you saw the two helicopters collide, we could, never we could never get that to happen by a kid pulling the zip cord. So we rigged it because it ha added to the drama and sense of the commercial. Now, maybe after a thousand tries, kids could do it, and that was our justification. Sure, a kid could do it, okay? <laughs> but for the commercial, we didn't have a thousand tries, okay? So we rigged it. And um, 
Uh, I will go down in infamy for many other things at Hasbro as well, but for this uh, commercial. They also had to use a prototype Duke because there wasn't a current Duke at the time, so I thought it'd be fun to show that recoil painted prototype with the Duke head on it. We'll keep moving. This was the mystery character. There is the mystery rigged uh, battle copter. So there was actually a battery in there uh, that kept the rotor moving and it was suspended from fishing poles uh, to have the illusion that it's flying itself, but really they were moving it with fishing poles. So that's how they were able to uh, capture the impossible. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. And this is where they got sued. Next slide. <laughs> And this explains a little bit about uh, why they got sued, so a little more detail. Next slide. Okay, so this is the uh, behind the scenes footage of the next commercial followed by the new master of the next commercial. Ready and action. Duke needs help. Send in the air commandos. Here's our Cobra Sky Creeper, all suited up and ready to go into combat. We've all been wondering how exactly this was gonna work. And we should know in a few minutes. And now, I'll tell you when, Gary. And ready? Now! All right, cut! Phil, you look comfortable up there. It's like a mannequin, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> ready? Now! Phil, look. Turn it on. From here, drop it down, look around, bring it back up. Here we go. Action! Hello, it's Phil. Yeah, shake it a little. Okay, rotate. Stay, pull it all the way. Down up. Cool. And action. Step down, guys. Step down. And stop. Come on over and see the replay. Play it back again. Come here. Play it back. Keep rolling. You got it? Got it. Action. Got You're all washed up, Cobra! I must have the plasma tox! The battle for the plasma tox takes to the skies with Joe and Cobra Air Commandos, soaring gliders that can fly up to 30 feet. I've got the plasma tox! Cobra! But here comes the G.I. Joe attack cruiser. It fires two missiles and a flying jet bomb. Cobra Bumbles! Air Commandos come with figure. Attack cruiser sold separately. G.I. Joe, American Quickly, it should go with, with me at least recognizing Ren Roberts' diligence in filming these commercials. He never said no to anything. And when you see him fighting in that water, this was filmed in Vancouver, Canada. Um, it was filmed in a studio that was unheated on December 13th, okay? The water in that swimming pool was about 35 degrees, oh, wow. okay? And he did about seven or nine takes, and he never said no. John kept saying, another one, another one, and he'd keep doing it. Get into a new, clean change of clothes, we'd drop him in there, and he'd get soaking wet. Never a, never a complaint. They only had two or three costumes, and so they'd throw the costume in a dryer, put him in the other costume. Uh, for this scene, his hair was already wet because he's jumping up out of the puddle, but for the other scene where he wrecked the battle copter, they had to take 30 minutes between each take so that they could fix his perfect hair because he was starting out dry. And uh, the first scene that didn't make the commercial, uh, Duke is in trouble, call in the air commandos. They made up a joke about him. They were like, Duke is in trouble, call in the hair commandos. <laughs> And so they had some fun picking at his perfect hair. Uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about was how dangerous the shoot was. On the last explosion with Night Vulture, I believe that's Night Vulture's Air Commando glider, the last explosion didn't blow up. It actually blew the wing apart. So you can see holes in the top right corner up there. And that was the last take and they were done. And I'll, I'll tell you, the director sounded nervous. He was like, cut. <laughs> you know? It was a little perilous. The other thing was uh, when Kirk was driving in the battle wagon, it literally caught fire while he's in there, the back end of this thing. Kirk, you want to talk about yeah, the danger? Um, we, we didn't have a lot of money, <laughs> so we couldn't hire extras. So everybody on the shoot was pressed into service as extras, unpaid, by the way, and because uh, there's no SAG up in Canada at the time. I don't even know if there is today. Anyway, I was the driver of the battle wagon, so they suited me up. Ren's on the outside 
uh, manning the machine gun and I'm in the cage driving. And they had to lock that cage because um, it was on a, a rolling thing that made the battle wagon look like, it was, look like it was going up and down and you didn't want the cockpit cage to flap, so it was locked down. And you can see in the commercial, you'll see Squibs machine gun fire go across the outside of the battle wagon. Uh, we did this about three times and on the third take, um, the explosions went off. Now that's made out of plywood. That, that battle wagon was made out of like quarter inch plywood. On the last take, I hear John Sterner yell, it's on fire, get him out! <laughs> and I'm looking around going, what is he talking about? And sure enough, the back half of the battle wagon was burning on fire, okay? Now my wife in the audience, she's got a shocked look on her face. She never knew that story. So. <laughs> All right, so this is behind the scenes footage for the next commercial, followed by the commercial. Ready and action! Rock, go! Bubble Duck Commander! You can see how uh, yeah, toxic, bubbling, bubbling toxo is good. sludge is. Violent bubbling is good. A little more smoke, tape, bubbles on. Bubbles on, Lindsay. Dry ice in. Ready, Jay? When we run the camera, you stop pulling. Camera? Rolling. Ready, action! Pour it! Action! Pour! Good! Great! Now we'll look at our set from the other end. This is an air cannon which is going to help cause some of the explosions. And that thing up top is what's going to blow off when we actually destroy the Cobra Toxo Sludge Factory. This is what the tanks look like. And we step around to the back. That's an air cannon that's going to blow the roof off. This is Alan, our pyrotechnics and special effects master. Ready, fill! Action! Here's a look at the carnage left from the explosion. And this is our G.I. Joe brawler. You can see the battle damage. It's a little more than I would think a real brawler would take, but it works for the, uh, for the commercial. Take action! And I just had it washed! I'm going in! Action! And I just had it washed! I'm going in! Anchor! We've now created the uh, polar ice cave that Duke is going to run through. This is our set from last week. Here's uh, our hero, Duke, playing with his M16. <laughs> Ready and action! The plasma talks! Now I can pollute the entire world! The G.I. Joe Brawler attacks, blasting Cobra with twin missile launchers. Fire! But the Cobra Ice Saber strikes back with a cap-firing rocket launcher. Fire! The five panels blew up! And I just had it washed! I'm going in! G.I. Joe Brawler and Cobra Ice Saber sold separately. G.I. Joe! This is going to be a real blast! G.I. Joe! I just leaned over and, and said to Carson, um, you know how Cobra Commander is dumping out that little plasma tox? And the next time you get a McDonald's milkshake, realize you're drinking plasma tox. <laughs> because that's what goes into a McDonald's milkshake, that cleared, it's actually plastic is what they call it. Wow. And then they mix it with the uh, flavoring and coloring, but that's a McDonald's milkshake. So the lesson of the day is don't drink McDonald's milkshakes. <laughs> Or, right. or enjoy a glass of plasma tox. Yeah. So we'll keep moving to the next commercial. Action! This is gonna be a real blast! This is gonna be a real blast! Ready and action! This is gonna be a real blast! Got real ballsy, fast, tough, jump This is gonna be a real blast! That feels right. Action! This is gonna be a real blast! Action! Whoa! This is John Sterner and our film crew. 
along with the agency. This is our shot board. Every time we knock off a shot, a red X is placed over that. You want the Joe figures on a slightly higher level than the Cobra figures? Yes, I want them separated, they're separated like, three and three. They're like fighting roosters. They can't be in the same right. area. Right. You got it. He has no other weapon. He's just standing by looking like, you know. I want some drip camera. And action. Ready and action. Get him tough, yeah! Ready and zoom, action! Back, action! Ready and zoom, action! Oh, yes! Right, rotate. Camera, ready, action! Dip in, don't lean in yet. Lean in, I said, great! Great! A little shake this time, ready and action! And shake and squeeze, there problem. you go! <laughs> to pollute the environment, Cobra unleashes the septic tank and evil eco-warriors. But the Joes have eco-warriors too. I'll take it, Duke. The septic tank and eco-warriors have powerful water guns. And when hit, they change color to reveal battle damage. My suit's corroding. Clean them up. G.I. Joe, yeah, the Joe and Cobra color change eco-warriors and septic tanks sold separately. I'm only begun to mess around. Go, go. So one of the things, that's not as much live action in that commercial, but it's still in the linear sequence because in the last one he got shot by the his tank and fell into the pool of sludge, and in this one they're washing him off. So that speaks to the story of this being a, one long linear narrative. Um, the other thing I wanted to say was that Ren Roberts was not a trained stunt man, so all that stuff he's going through, he had some people, they brought in people that trained him. The guy that played interrogator was his trainer, uh, and, and Ren was learning on the job, so to speak. So one time when he jumped on the paralyzer and they were doing rehearsals and the interrogator didn't have the helmet on, he broke his nose. He said his nose was sideways and he felt terrible for the rest of the three weeks. So you want to talk at all about the stunts and, and how yeah, rigorous I mean, the shoot was? In the, like I say, this commercial was were shot between the end of Thanksgiving, I left the day after Thanksgiving, and I came home the day before Christmas Eve. It was supposed to be a two week shoot. Mm. And my wife was home with, you know, I think a seven, a four, a seven, a four, and a two-year-old or something like that. And two weeks into the shoot, I sent her some flowers uh, because I knew the shoot was going to be extended. And so she said, when I talked to her that night, she said, what were the flowers for? Because I've never sent my wife flowers. Okay. <laughs> And I said, well, I'm going to be here another week. <laughs> and then I called her the next Saturday and said, I'm going to be here another week. And uh, she was really good about it. She, she handled it well. She knew it, was, uh, she knew it was part of the job. She just said, please, try and get home before Christmas. And the day I was supposed to fly out, which I think was the 22nd or 23rd, I forget now, um, Vancouver had the biggest snowstorm since 1932 and the airport was shut down. So I called her at 7 o'clock at night and I said, uh, I'm stuck in Vancouver for another day. And she said, fine, if you want to stay in Vancouver and miss Christmas for this stupid commercial shoot. <laughs> so we're still, we're still celebrating it yeah. here 25 years later, to yeah. be fair. And we're still married, happily. And she's been the best, best support. And We'll move on to the next commercial. We've got about 10 minutes. These doors are your typical Star Trek type doors. These are our Cobra sludge tanks. And you can see our Cobra janitor inside cleaning them all out, getting ready to receive a new batch of Toxo sludge. There's a Cobra Toxo Viper hard at work, putting in a tough day at the office. Here we are in the Cobra sludge room. How about the door light, Gary? Toxo sludge bubbling and boiling. Cobra Commander and his elite crimson guard at the control panels. Ready and action! I'm the second level coming in the world! With Toxo sludge! Action! The second level coming in the world! Action! 
Oh, and something that was going to the entire world! What's that sauce, lad? Thanks, bro. He's got to go. Is the Gatling gun being moved into position? As you can see, the battle wagon has been uh, completely weathered and is very battle tested. Look at this. He loads the shop back up with the dust. And here's how it works. This is uh, Kirk Bozigian preparing for his film debut in the mini G.I. Joe movie being shot in Vancouver. I may have a whole new career here, guys. As you can see, he looks pretty rugged. He's either going into a movie set or he's going to uh, Saudi Arabia. That's Kirk Bozigian inside that cockpit. He's inside the uh, G.I. Joe battle wagon. War is out. <laughs> he says war is out. Thumbs up. All right. Get the wheel going real fast. And ready, push. Ready, and action. Push. Ready, action. Woo, man. Ready, and action. Good one. Set on bombs. Here we go. Set. Tape. Roll tape. Tape speed. Camera. Tape speed. Ready and action. Cut. 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 Rolling into action, it's the battery-powered G.I. Joe Battle Wagon with motorized four-wheel drive. Yeah, I get a bad feeling about this. The Battle Wagon's motorized gun shoots eight rapid-fire missiles. Yeah, the Battle Wagon's winch will bring the house down. The four-wheel drive Battle Wagon, each sold separately with rapid-fire gun. Bigger sold separately, batteries not included. So that footage, I'll be back, G.I. Joe, didn't make it the cut. It wasn't in the commercials. It was just Kirk caught it behind the scenes. So thanks to him for catching all of this footage. We have so much more of it. We'll be posting a 47-minute edit that's pretty much wall-to-wall -wall narrative of Kirk either narrating what's happening or the director giving a lot of feedback. Um, we'll also post the 20 minutes worth of edited videos that we shared throughout the presentation. There's a bunch of different thematic clips. And again, Kirk hasn't seen this stuff in 25 years. So any, any uh, thoughts? How many more minutes do we have? Quick. Five. Five minutes? Okay. Plus, I've got the next piano, so I can... Ha, we can run along. <laughs> I don't know how Larry's no, going to Larry won't. That. Larry won't appreciate that. <laughs> All right. Um, well, we do have another clip if we want to play it as kind of the closing out. Here we are setting up for the grand finale shot. You know the 1812 overture? Well, the G.I. Joe War and Peace epic has its own 1812 overture. As we blast the G.I. Joe Battle Wagon Gatling Cannon. See if we can get a Gatling gun action, which will be cut into the live portion of the commercials to simulate the Battle Wagon destroying Cobra's Temple of Doom. Here we go. Ready and action. Twenty-four setups. Twenty-four setups. Here's Fire David films. applying the final X setups. to our Better to our shoot. This production house again. <laughs> Not if they put us through this hell again. <laughs> War is hell. We found Shoots that out making this, making this shoot this year. Next year, we've got all the bugs out. Next year, we'll even do it better. Tim. <laughs> And so the final curtain rings down on the uh, 1991 G.I. Joe production. Get a panoramic view of the studio once again as we finally break down on the final day of shooting. Our home for the last three and a half weeks. There's a lot more footage and we'll post all of it. Uh, I'll let Kurt finish up the last few minutes. It was just, like I say, it was, it was a disrupting kind of commercial. We did it for the next couple of years. Um, it rejuvenated the G.I. Joe brand. 
G.I. Joe, I believe, had been down as low as $89 million in sales um, when I came back on the brand in 1989, coincidentally. And with this series of commercials, the brand shot back up to $115 million. Now, that's just domestic sales. That wasn't global sales because we weren't a global company at that time. We had G.I. Joe in various countries, but they were under license. So we were getting royalties for their sales. We weren't getting their actual sales volume. Um, so that, that, it was just an amazing shoot. Made a lot of good lifetime friendships on that shoot with the uh, people involved. Um, Willie Suarez, Tim Spidell, Jay Bacall, who was responsible for all the Sunbow animation. He's in this, uh, at this shoot. And the other interesting thing is, um, all, every other shoot I had ever been on, either Tom Griffin or Joe Bacall was on the shoot as support. Neither one ever came to these shoots. They, and that was a sign of confidence that they had in us and the team developing and you know, uh, filming these commercials. So those guys, John Sterner, his Firehouse Films uh, crew, they were spectacular. Like I say, John had never ever done theatrical, if you will in quotes, kind of a shoot before. Um, we spent months, literally from, as I recall, from July until November uh, doing pre-production meetings every couple of weeks in New York. How are we going to film plasma talks? How are we going to do the, simulate the explosions? How are we going to do all these stunts? Um, who's going to do the costuming? I mean, all the things that go into doing a real movie were things we had to think about and sort out. And so it was a, a, an incredible experience. I'm glad Carson put it all together because otherwise these little Super 8 Sony cassettes would still be collecting dust in my basement. So uh, I wanted to share it with you people. So thank you all. It's wall to wall back there, man. This is an amazing turnout. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. I'm applauding for you as well. Thank you. Thank you.